Hey everyone, this is Pete, and welcome to Atari A to Z Anthology. In this series, we'll be looking at the Atari 2600 output of Activision, Imagic, and Absolute Entertainment, as chronicled in the various Activision Anthology releases for various platforms. As much as I like those collections though, emulation has come a long way in terms of accuracy since they were released, and as such we'll be looking at the games using the most up-to-date emulators, and foregoing some of Activision Anthology's more gimmicky features such as the special projection modes it was possible to play the games in. The focus here is very much on the games themselves, because back in the heyday of the Atari 2600, an Activision, Imagic or Absolute Entertainment badge was almost always a guarantee of a quality release. Almost always, anyway. We begin our journey with Barnstorming, a 1982 release from Activision, developed by Steve Cartwright. It was Cartwright's first game, and he would go on to produce a number of other titles for Activision on various platforms, including Mega Mania, Sequest, Plaque Attack, Frostbite, Hacker, Hacker 2, Aliens, and GB Air Rally. In 1988, he followed Activision founders Alan Miller and Bob Whitehead to Accolade, where he designed two point-and-click adventures in the Les Manley series. Now, these were noteworthy for being the first games to make use of digitised actors as sprites. He then moved on to work with EA, primarily on the PGA Tour Golf series, and he's taken various roles in and around the industry ever since. One of his most recent projects is the Bluescape Wall, which is a cloud-based collaboration system designed for use on large touchscreen displays, and one which Lucasfilm has supposedly made extensive use of to storyboard Star Wars movies. But I digress, we're here to talk about 40-year-old video games, not the latest and greatest technology, so let us return to Barnstorming. Barnstorming, like so many other video games from the late 70s and early 80s, has a very simple inspiration. Supposedly, Cartwright saw a biplane towing a banner advertisement flying past him on the way home during his first week at Activision, and this inspired him to make a video game. It's a plausible story, though it is worth noting that the only source for this origin story we appear to have is a Game of the Week article on ClassicGaming.com, a site later swallowed by GameSpy and ultimately IGN. The article was written by someone calling themselves Fragmaster, which was actually a pseudonym of one Kevin Bowen, better known to many internet denizens as the former administrator and monitor of the notorious Something Awful forums, and it was seemingly published around 2008 or so. Meanwhile, Cartwright himself, speaking with the catchily named Creative Computing Video and Arcade Games Volume 1 Number 2 from fall of 1983, only noted that the idea came to him in about two seconds, but it took three months to translate that idea into a playable game. We are constantly coming up with and rejecting ideas, he said. We find ourselves imagining everything we see around us as a video game. It just so happened that it was possible to translate the idea of barnstorming into a game. And so that's how barnstorming came to be. So let's go play barnstorming. Okay, here we are with Barnstorming from Activision. I'm just going to take a quick look at the instructions first of all, which I've got a scan of here. Um, so yeah. Pull on your goggles and check out your controls. You're about to embark on a daredevil flight through the wild blue yonder. But before you take off, take a minute to read over these instructions. You'll be glad you did. Barnstorming Basics. That's just how to start the game up. And then select the game with the game select switch. Game one, hedge hopper, fly through 10 barns on a fixed course. Game two is crop duster, fly through 15 barns on a fixed course. Game three is stunt pilot, fly through 15 barns on a fixed course that is different from game two. And game four is flying ace, where you fly through 25 barns, which is randomly generated each time you select it. The object of the game is to fly through a set number of barns in the shortest possible time. Each time you make it through a barn, your barn count number on the upper left corner of the screen will de decrease by one. If you miss a barn, your barn count will remain the same, and you will have to fly further to reach an additional barn. When your barn count reaches zero, the game is ended. That's about it, really. So getting the feel of barnstorming by Activision. Just as in flying a real biplane, you'll need to get the feel of the controls. The better you get adjusting your throttle and handling your joystick, the better your chances to become a flying ace. You needn't worry about stalling out in mid-air. Your throttle is set to maintain a minimum speed even when you release the red button. The game is mastered by looking ahead and adjusting the controls to make the best speed. Fly through every barn and over every windmill and avoid those pesky geese. Whenever you push the throttle, watch out for the geese. The best time is achieved by covering the course with the fewest possible corrections to your altitude, so precious seconds can be shaved by flying just above the windmills and just below the openings of the barns. 
Okay, um, so the, the geese that it's on about are one of the obstacles. Uh, and then the windmills you can crash into. We'll see all this when we actually start playing it. If you should misjudge and fly over a barn, your barn count will remain unchanged and the course will be extended and you can, until you can make up the missed barns and fly through the required number. Avoid crashes with barn roofs, barn interiors, weather vanes, windmills and geese will really save time. Better to slow down a little and avoid a crash than to lose time picking up speed from a dead stop. If you beat a time of 33.3 seconds on game 1, 51 seconds on game 2, or 54 seconds on game 3, you can join our Activision Flying Aces. Just send us a picture of your television screen, along with your name and address, and we will enroll you in this prestigious organisation. So yeah, this was standard practice for Activision games. They would offer some sort of challenge in the manual, and if you sent them proof of you achieving that, uh, used your photograph, uh, then they would send you a patch which you could sew onto your clothing, uh, which is rather cool. It's very much a sort of proto-achievement sort of thing, if you want to look at it that way. How to become an ace at barnstorming by Activision. Tips from Steve Cartwright, designer of barnstorming. Steve is the newest member of the Activision design team. He was discovered by David Crane. There are two stages involved in mastering this game. After playing the game a few times, you'll begin to learn the course. But knowing what is coming up ahead, you can keep your biplane at full speed. But being able to fly through the barns and over the windmills is only the beginning. The real secret is in carefully navigating through the flocks of geese. With practice, it is possible to fly the course at full speed with no collisions. It has really been a great challenge designing my first game for Activision, and I'd particularly like to thank David Crane for his help in getting me off the ground. You see what he did there? Steve Cartwright, PS, drop me a line. I'd love to hear about your daredevil exploits. I wonder if anyone actually wrote to him. Look for more Activision games wherever you buy video game cartridges. Drop us a note and we'll gladly add your name to our mailing list. Anyway, um, yeah, I guess it's time to go and play Barnstorming. So, I'll be right back. Okay, here we are with Barnstorming, ready to go on the runway, or the improvised runway, such as it may be. Uh, we can switch between our four different games with the Game Select switch. And then when we're ready to go, we press the Game Reset switch on the Atari 2600. And we're ready to go. So 10 barns to go in as fast a time as possible. We're trying to beat 33.3 seconds to be part of the Activision uh, barnstorming elite. So off we go. So this game is pretty simple. You control your biplane and your aim is simply to avoid the weather wings, which I failed to do there. And pass through the bands. And you see that bumping into anything doesn't cause you to crash as such, but it does cause you to lose a bit of precious time. Because it knocks you back slightly and it pretty much brings you to a, a dead stop as well. The geese aren't quite as serious a threat as some of the other ones. 42.5, not a bad start for a first effort. Let's have another go. So if we want to play again, we just press game reset again and then fire to begin. Oops, missed that one. So the controls in this are very simple. It's up and down to change your altitude and press and hold the fire button to increase your throttle. As it said in the manual, if you let go of the throttle, your your plane will maintain a, a sort of baseline speed, so it won't stall and fall out of the air or anything like that. I, was, uh, I don't know if that was slightly better or not. It was about the same, wasn't it? All right, let's try again. So yeah, basically, you want to try and go as, as quickly as you can. Through the whole course while having as, as few collisions as possible. And as the manual says, it's better to slow down slightly to avoid a collision than actually suffer a collision and lose a lot of time as a result. Oh! 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 38.46, we're definitely improving. We're still not quite at patch status yet, but uh, let's give it another go. And 
Now, if you're familiar with Atari 2600 games that look like a bunch of blocks moving around, this probably looks quite good for an Atari 2600 game. So if you, can, if you compare this to a lot of the stuff that Atari themselves were putting out on the Atari 2600, this was one of Activision's main distinguishing features. Is The company was set up by people who made some of the best games for Atari in the first place. Um, and they really knew how to make the hardware sing. Um, and this wasn't like sort of immensely secret techniques or anything like that. They just had some really good ideas on how to make creative use of the Atari 2600's capabilities. And that allowed them to achieve things like the, the sunset effect in the background. That's a very iconic Activision <coughs> graphical element. I think I remember reading somewhere that this was actually the first game which used it. Like Steve Cartwright came up with the the method for making a sunset appear like that uh, on the Atari 2600 and it ended up being used in so many different Activision games it became a bit of a sort of calling card for them whoops and that was a good example of Activision's technical proficiency with these games because it's sort of it's sort of showing more colours than the Atari 2600 is supposed to be able to do at once. Because again, if you look at a lot of old Atari games, they used maybe no more than two or three colours on screen at once. Whereas this, yes, there's still few enough colours that you could probably count the colours yourself if you wanted to. out of the way um, there's a lot more than usual and like I said that became a real hallmark of Activision games in general they were colourful they looked good the things in the game looked like the things they were supposed to look like instead of a collection of blocks that just sort of loosely resembled something my, my favourite example of that is if you think back to something like slot races that we saw in the Atari A to Z flashback series a while back um the cars in that look ridiculous because when they turn around corners, like just the front nose of them bent around the corner, so it looked like a sort of elephant going around the corner. Whereas in Activision games, if an Activision game said, Oh, you're flying a biplane, your sprite would look like a biplane. The geese look like geese, the barns look like barns, the windmills look like windmills. Albeit those kind of little windmills you get in sort of stereotypical um, farmland in the United States. Oh, I cannot crack that time, can I? Oh, start again. But this is a great example of an Activision game in terms of gameplay as well. Activision games were typically quite simple, very easy to pick up. But tricky to master. And that made them really good, really compelling arcade style experiences that had a, a really solid understanding of risk versus reward and that sort of thing. One interesting observation I found from a modern perspective is that these days, if I want to play something quick that's sort of like a nice little time waster, more often than not, I will reach for an Atari 2600 game, usually via emulation, uh, rather than actually sort of getting the original hardware out. But For me, having spent some time getting to know the system and its library, Atari 2600 games have very much taken the place of mobile games for me. A lot of people describe mobile games as sort of their primary sort of means of time wasting. So like when, they, when they've got a few minutes to wire away or whatever, they just, they just open up a mobile game and just tap on their gacha waifus a few times or something like that. 
But for me, I find Atari 2600 games much more rewarding and effective in that regard. Because they provide a game experience that is meaningful and challenging. Oh, are we going to do it? Not quite. Not quite. Oh. I really should be counting those windmills, shouldn't I? So that I'm ready for them each time. Right. But yeah, absolutely. If if I've got something like one of my Ambernick handhelds with me, um, and I just think, oh, I've got a few minutes to spare. I'm waiting for someone. Or I'm waiting for my car to be serviced or whatever. Or I, any, anything where you're just sitting around for a few minutes and you don't want to sort of get stuck into like a big deep game or something like that. But you do want to do something to just sort of occupy your mind for a few minutes. Oh no! Um, for me, Atari 2600 games are perfect for that. Yeah, absolutely perfect for that. And Activision games in particular are great because they have that real arcade style risk versus reward in which every game every individual game you play feels meaningful and slightly different and you can feel your skills improving with each passing game or declining as the case may be let's start again that's never going to happen is it And yeah, I absolutely, genuinely, unironically love them. And so if you're like me and you've become somewhat fed up of like predatory monetization and being stuffed with ads and all that crap that you get in mobile games today, I highly recommend you find some means of getting a, a portable Atari 2600 emulator, whether it's on your phone or on a dedicated handheld or something like that. And just get hold of a bunch of Activision games and a few Atari games I'd recommend as well, but mostly Activision games to be perfectly honest. And just enjoy them and you'll find they are the perfect, the perfect games with which to while away a few minutes. I always find it quite interesting to return to games like that from a modern perspective because so few games these days are designed to be sort of things that you play over the short term. So many games today want to absolutely take over your life. I remember discussing this back when, it must have been around when Minecraft first came out. Um, a friend of mine described stuff like Minecraft as lifestyle games because they were games that expected you to make them a significant part of your daily life often to the exclusion of other stuff and while there's, there's, while there's games that I enjoy in that regard like I, I will always love a good RPG for example no. I would always love a good RPG, for example. Um, at the time of recording, I am, to uh, put it in as offensive a way as possible, I am balls deep in Final Fantasy 16 right now. Um, sometimes you just want something that you can just sit down and play that there's no long-term commitment for, there's no campaign mode, there's no need to save your game, there's no need to do anything like that. It's just something you just something you can play and enjoy for the sake of it. Perhaps while doing something else. So that this this you can see is a great game to and sit and play while you're talking because you don't have to concentrate on it too hard. Yes, you do have to concentrate on it to a certain degree in order to actually succeed at it. But to just enjoy it on a basic level, 
yeah, you can you can kind of tune out with this one. I'm doing terribly. Right, let's actually concentrate for this run. Right, another windmill. Into a barn. And two windmill. No, three windmills. And two barns. No. Oh, I've got to learn this course. Right. One barn. One windmill, one barn. One windmill, one barn. Two windmills. One barn. Three windmills. One barn. One windmill, two windmill. Two barns. One windmill. Right. Let's see if I can remember that. Nope, I failed to remember it. Oh dear. Alright, up and away. Gotta go straight up at the beginning to get over the top of that windmill. Alright, now it's two of them. Then another barn. And three of them. Another barn. Oh, just one there. Okay, I've nearly got it fixed in my head now. Those bloody geese though. Right, one of these, and one of these, and two, no, another one of them, then two of these, and one of them, and three of them, and one of them, and then two of them, and one of them. three of them. So it really is about sort of developing a kind of racing line through them, if you want. The one that one that weaves around those geese as much as possible. No, right, that's not good, is it? Oh. It's harder than it looks. It really is. Alright. Oh, damn it. Ah, right. This time. This time's the one. No, no it isn't. Not a bad effort though. Still nowhere near that 33 seconds mark though. It's avoiding the geese is the really tricky bit. If they don't feel like they slow you down that much, but they do have quite a significant impact. Get out of the way! Uh, 
Uh, I think you got to master the art. You got to master the art of tactical slowing down. Because as it says in the manual, if you can, if you can make it so you slow down on your own terms, rather than because you hit something, you'll do much better. There we go. No. <laughs> Oh dear, this is never going to happen, is it? Oh! That was almost looking nice at that point. So slow down a little bit to... No. I'm going to master this. No. No. <laughs> no. Oh, this is so upsetting. All right, thread the needle. There we go. Oh, I hit the barn that time. This is going to be a terrible run. A truly terrible run. Actually, it wasn't that bad after all that. Right, come on, carefully. Slow down. No. Nope. Slowly. Oh, I missed one. Right, thread the needle. No. Through the barn. Slow down. Thread the needle. Through the barn. Through the barn. Oh, I've got to remember you can go higher as well. It's so tempting to just sort of try and stay as low as possible, which is not a terrible idea, but. For avoiding stuff, sometimes it is sometimes it is helpful to just go a bit higher. So slow down, thread the needle, and through the barn, over the top, through the barn. Damn it! That was terrible. Right, over the top. Nope. Those geese do always seem to see appear in the same pattern, at least. So you can learn that as well. Right, carefully. And let's go over the top. Right, then we have three, I think. Yeah. And down. And one. Damn it. Oh. I'm forgetting the sequence again. Right, through there, and there, through there. Two of them, one of them, and over the top and through there. All right, no! Oh, I always forget that one. Right, slow down, through there, down here, through there. No. <laughs> oh, it's going so poorly. I'm losing my concentration. But hopefully you can see, this is just game one that I'm playing here. It's game one of four. There's a lot of longevity here trying to master this. got this. No, I don't got this. 
through the barn, through the gap, through the barn, slowly, slowly, through the barn, carefully over the top, through the barn, and two of them, no, three of them, and through the barn, then one, that's it, then two, then two in sequence, then just one, and three of these. Best time so far, I think. Alright, let's just have a couple more goes, and then I will put you all out of your misery. Alright, no. That one didn't count. Carefully, through there, through there, through there. It actually doesn't matter too much if you hit geese at low speed because you're already going at that low speed anyway. Oh, damn. I might have finally remembered the sequence, eh? Just a case of actually committing to it. It's that, it's that little bit there. I always forget the two in a row. The two windmills in a row. Down here. No, and that first one. Right, so the first three barns, there's just one windmill in between them. Then there's two. Then three. Two in a row. All right. Now gradually improving a tiny bit at a time. Yes, yeah, so I won't. I won't put you through much more of this. But I would like to see how close we can get to the challenge time, as it were. Oh, just came down slightly too low there. Oh, damn it. Alright, up, down, up, down, up, down two there, and another two, I think, or is it three? It's three. Oh, damn. Right, first barn. Second barn. Am I remembering that wrong? The so first barn. Second barn. Third barn. Then two. Then three. Then one. Then two. It's no good remembering the numbers if I don't act on them, is it? So one. One. Then two. And then three to finish. Oh, it was close. It was close. All right, come on, we're getting there. All right, totally up, up. And two in a row. Three in a row. Oh, 
Da den gehe ich. Is it? Right now, three. Oh, did, uh, some of those sequences of geese I just don't know how you get through because they supposedly spawn when you press the throttle I don't really understand how that works But it is apparently something to do with that. You press button, you make geese appear. I do, just hovering around the 35 to 36 second mark. Alright, executive decision. This is the last go. This is the last go. Okay, then a three, then a one, then a two. Oh, piss. I was having such good concentration at the beginning of this. This is the last go. One. And one. And then two. And then three. Carefully through the middle. Yeah, good. And one. And two. And through the two buttons. And then there's just one. And there's three. Oh no! Oh, that was going so well. Come on, one more. One more. One more. Alright. There's the two. Then there's the three. Another two. This isn't going to be the one. That's all that's going through my mind right now. That sound. Alright, then three. One. Two. One and two. One. Oh, no, I think that's the best I can do for now. I'm, I'm going to have to call it there. Um, but yeah, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you can see the appeal of this game because. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed that. <laughs> it's a fun game. It's one of my Activision's simplest games. But it's it's good. It's beloved for a, a very good reason. So yeah, that was Barnstorming. As always, thank you very much for watching. And I'll see you again next time.